Today we have a very uh, special guest, Joey Gonzalez. He's the CEO of Barry's, the original uh, cardio and strength interval workout that began a global uh, boutique fitness movement. They started in 1998. Uh, their game-changing fitness classes quickly became known as the best workouts in the world. His Barry's journey started in 2003 before he became the CEO of the business in 2015. Uh, Joey has dedicated his life to expanding the Barry's brand across the country and around the world. Uh, Barry's now has over 70 studios in 14 countries across the UK, the US, France, Italy, Scandinavia, Mexico, Australia, and other locations. Uh, today, Barry's welcomes over 145,000 people through its doors every week. In 2018, uh, Joey was named to Fast Company's Most Creative People in Business List. Also in 2018, Barry's was named uh, to Comparably's 2018 Top 25 Happiest Companies list. And he sits on the board of Family Equality Council and studies at HBS. And welcome, Joey. Thank you. Awesome. Um, let me just stop sharing my screen. So I kind of skipped the early parts of um, your journey. Today's session is the business uh, of following your passion. And uh, I know it's very much a follow your heart type of story uh, from the early days. So if you can just kind of uh, share that early part of, um, you know, you moving to Los Angeles, uh, joining the company, uh, and, and those early days with the company. Sure. Um, so I actually moved to LA, uh, to go to USC. And at the time I grew up acting, I started in junior high, high school. I was around 13 when I started working professionally. Um, and I, went to Los Angeles to continue to pursue that, uh, but became kind of disenchanted with it after a few years in LA and was at a crossroads in my life where I was looking for something different. Uh, and I started as a client first at Barry's and just became obsessed with it. <clears throat> and then soon after I became an instructor and that's when I really experienced firsthand what it felt like to, to actually transform lives, which is our vision statement. Um, after that, I was completely hooked and I pretty much took any opportunity I could to work at Barry's in various roles. Um, the next of which was managing the business for five years. So uh, at the time, the business was only two very small studios in Los Angeles. Uh, and I expressed you know, several times to the founders that I was really interested in investing not only all the time I had, but it, all the money that I had. Uh, and in 2009, um, they finally gave me the opportunity. So I began to move around to different cities, first San Diego, then New York City. Uh, and I was really just expanding the business. You know, that was, that was my prime, um, my, my prime duty was to move to these locations, take on all of the like marketing ops, as well as development and launch new studios. Um, and then in 2015, when North Castle invested, uh, that was our first private equity investment. Um, one of their requests was for me to step into the CEO position. And at the time, I was the COO. So I accepted and you know, I've just been learning and growing ever since. <clears throat> awesome. Can you tell us a little bit of that uh, kind of transition to private equity and packaging the company uh, to be attractive for that? Can you give us a little bit uh, how that happened? How you brought them on? How we brought the private equity on? Yeah. Um, so until 2015, we had grown organically and honestly, there was no such thing as boutique fitness um, from probably 1998 when we began until around 2006 is when a few others started to pop up. Um, I just recognized how quickly some of them were growing and we had been, been growing, you know, fairly slowly and organically. Uh, and so I just began the dialogue with my partners around, you know, look, I think we really need to take on a partner that can help us accelerate our growth. Um, so we began a process and went out, you know, had a competitive process, auction process, and there were plenty of different groups interested. North Castle stood out to me and to my partners because we felt like they really understood boutique fitness. Uh, they had helped also bring Equinox from nine to 42 uh, stores in uh, the early 2000s or mid 2000s, I believe. Um, so the other thing was they felt very aligned with our values and they really understood how important 
culture was at Barry's. So. Awesome. Yeah. Um, as, as entrepreneurs, we almost think of ourselves as like kind of the front line uh, of the economy and being the Barry's is sort of the early, you know, in the boutique space with everything changing now in COVID. <coughs> How are you guys thinking about uh, innovation and adapting to, to what's happening as we slowly uh, open back up again? Yeah, I mean, there, it, there's been a lot of immediate change. Um, I think right away, the first thing that we did, that Barry's did, our reaction was to, within 24 hours, start to launch free content on our Instagram handle. Um, and so we offered two work workouts a day um, and we began to um, message our customers, stay connected to and engaged with our customers and continue to deliver on our like mission and vision just in, in a different way, right? Because it was this unique global experience where everybody was forced to just be in their homes. And a lot of people didn't have any equipment they didn't have uh, anything to work with, right? Um, and so we recognized that and most of our workouts for the first couple of weeks were just body weight only because that's that was the reality of the situation for people. Mm -hmm. um, and shortly thereafter, we launched um, a band package. It was called Barry's Band Together Kit. And it was like uh, three different types of bands, upper body, lower body, et cetera. Um, and we launched those, we sold thousands of them to our customers, and we started to provide content then around using that band kit. Uh, and what, when it became clear that the closures were going to be a lot longer than any of us had expected, um, we launched our Berries at Home product, which has been an incredible, you know, sort of blown all our expectations out of the water, way to engage our customers, Did Digitally, but through a paid wall instead of only offering free content. Because mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, having closed every single studio across the country, uh, we had zero revenue coming in and we were still supporting a majority of our employees. Um, and to date, the revenue we generate from Berries at Home still doesn't cover, you know, even half of those costs, but mm -hmm. uh, it's something. Uh, and it's certainly something we continue to invest in for the long term. Definitely. And, and speaking of uh, Instagram and um, your kind of your community, your, your brand is, is awesome. I mean, if you could tell us whoever is managing your Instagram and your social media, you know, kudos to them. Uh, really amazing content. How does that process, uh, you know, look like in terms of your role and kind of interacting with the marketing team, creating content uh, and, and all that? Yeah, so I don't have anyone at a leadership level in marketing. Um, I've been without a CMO for about a year and a half. Um, and I was always really involved in marketing through the years. And so I have uh, a couple people at, you know, I have someone at a VP level who helps with PR, social media, content. She's extremely talented. Uh, and then I have somebody else who helps with the more traditional marketing and they both report into me. Um, and, you know, being a brand guardian for me has been very important. I still continue to look for that role, uh, the leadership role uh, at, at a marketing level. But for now, it's been it's been working well. Awesome. Uh, we're going to jump into some of these questions that were submitted. Um, first one from Sarah Hassan. She's asking, how did you get the others on board with your passion, uh, whether it's in the early days or as you expanded through New York and, and other uh, cities? <laughs> Um, how did I get others on board with my passion? Yeah. It's an interesting question. I mean, I th think the best way to motivate people is actually to understand what their passions are as well, mm -hmm. right? And to figure out a way to connect them. Um, we have, especially in the early days, Barry's had a very close, intimate, like family um, dynamic. And so having conversations, actively participating in conversations around your mission and your vision and your values and making sure that you're hiring people that are aligned um, from a values standpoint and then have a shared vision for what the mission and the vision are, I think is how to, how to do that. Great. Um, next question from Charlie uh, Melvin is asking your personal brand uh, as Joey's closely tied to the company. 
how do you uh, kind of differentiate that or how do you uh, integrate it with the brand or are you just everything Joey and yeah Harry's? hi Charlie I know Charlie well um, uh, berries is uh, deeply woven into my personal identity and I've learned you know it is important to set boundaries because uh, I am a person right and berries is a business for the most part I think it's worked very positively because uh, I'm incredibly accessible and people send me messages all the time, um, which are very informative. They help me understand whether like certain initiatives we've launched are or aren't working. They help me understand what some of our blind spots are. Um, and I think CEOs that don't have that visibility sometimes don't get to hear that. Right. I, I mean, I still teach as well. So I'm in, in studios at least once a week teaching class and, and really seeing how things are being executed. Um, but there have also been occasions where I'm dragged into issues that happen at the organization that I have nothing to do with. Um, and that's been really hard. Nice. Uh, Charlie, if you want to unpack your question further, feel free to, to jump in. Um, Next question from Juju B. Lee, uh, kind of going back to your passion, uh, you know, one of your, <laughs> your early interviews, um, which I saw on YouTube, you mentioned that um, you kind of found success early with Barry's and that's, you know, one of the reasons you kind of stuck around. Uh, what are some of the ways in terms of like evolving your, your passion and continuing that drive? What are like, uh, you know, some, some tricks or some methods that you use uh, to keep that passion going? Well, I think one of the benefits of leadership is that you can actually choose projects about which you feel passionately, right? So um, that's kind of how I've stayed uh, engaged, excited by the future of Berries is as the CEO, um, I continue to just think about the vision of what I want Berries to be. Uh, the first step is to focus on identifying a clear vision of that, right? And then to be able to communicate that vision in a way that's easily understood by your teams so that you can build out a strategy and that's how you successfully become actionable and you execute on it. And that way too, the final product meets your expectations. Nice. Um, next question we have from Robert uh, Montgomery uh, is kind of asking for advice and forming collaborations. I know you guys have like strategic partnerships with Oribe and Lululemon and such. How do you package uh, maybe some advice for startups. How do you, how do they package themselves in order to be attractive to like a strategic uh, partnership? Uh, most of ours, to be honest, I think because Berries has been around for so long, are are pretty organic. Um, we have a lot of customers from various global brands that reach out to us. You know, there are a lot of inbounds saying right. like we'd love to work together, which is a great position to be in. Um, but Orbe is actually one that we sought out. Uh, that's an interesting example. We had been using Malin and Get for many, many years um, and just thought it was time for a change and we wanted a little bit more of a premium product. And so we started to look around. Uh, we started to ask customers. I think it's really important to, to find out what your customers want, what resonates with them. Um, and you know, kicked off conversations with Orbe probably at least 18 months before we actually had product in stores. Mm. So it's definitely um, a long and journey the, getting those. A back. long journey. Mm -hmm. And you have to, I think the way to actually make them happen um, is you have to be able to, to leverage your brand, right? To, to bring attention to theirs as well. So you have to find brands um, that are going to work well and have and are going to be synergistic in nature mm -hmm. great we have some questions coming in the chat uh mehmet is asking how do you see the competition the replicability of berries uh within the space so we've had copycats for berries i mean for 21 years now you know we've had so many studios open up even with blocks within blocks of us that are doing almost exactly the same thing. For some reason, our business has just continued to grow. Uh, I think it's our investment in 
You know, it isn't just a hit workout that delivers results. It's a place that fosters a sense of community and belonging. We have, you know, a whole department called community marketing that's singularly focused on, you know, making sure people feel included, making sure people feel um, like their causes are important to us. Uh, they make all of the, uh, they organize all of our charity classes, et cetera. And then we have another department called client experience who are, their only objective is making sure that our customers leave feeling good about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, while that typically looks like milestone celebrations, you know, someone's 50th class or a birthday, or we found out a customer's pregnant and we have little, you know, baby sneakers waiting for them. Um, there are just ways I think to differentiate your business. Uh, what, no matter what its core um, competency is, no matter what the core product is. Um, the second part was around berries at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, um, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <clears throat> also berries for home. Did COVID-19 have any effect? Um, well, berries, berries at home actually was created because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. It didn't exist prior to that. Um, so it was our solution to, you know, how do we continue to engage with and drive revenue while all of our red rooms were closed? Just speaking of uh, that community, you know, factor you just mentioned, how, wh what are you doing in terms of uh, building community and keeping them engaged? Uh, is there any tactical advice um, that, that you can share with us for building communities and startups or other industries? Are you asking now with COVID-19 or just in general? Uh, in general, in general. How do you build community? Yeah, any tips on building community or what do you guys do at a, like a, maybe a, some sort of tactical level? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that has a lot to do with the, the team I mentioned earlier, the community marketing team. Mm -hmm. um, we have them on the ground months prior to launching. So we'll announce Berries is opening and before we even open, our community marketing manager or director will be on the ground, you know, boots on the ground, walking around, meeting people, um, hosting pop-ups. We do a lot of pop-ups so we can actually activate outside in parks and do fun things so that we're actually bringing together future members of the community before we even open. Um, we also have campaigns. We do something called the originals. So it gives people the opportunity to buy into, you know, become a founding member um, and have some really interesting perks that come along with it, which is like bring, you know, up to three or four friends for free every month and, you know, be invited to all the openings at new cities around the country. And um, so we start sort of laying the, the foundation for our community at least four or five months prior to opening. Great. Uh, some more questions coming in the chat from John Stammel. He's asking, with so much competition, your funding partners, what, what would you say they saw in whether it's the, the team, the leadership, or, or Barry's that was uh, kind of uh, your competitive advantage over the competition? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that stood out to a lot of the private equity groups that was that were wanting to invest in berries was proof of concept, right? We existed uh, in markets that were so different from one another. Because when you looked at a map, um, we had proven portability, we had proven scalability, like we had proven everything. We, we, it worked in Los Angeles, both in West Hollywood and the Valley in Sherman Oaks. Um, it worked in Bergen, Norway. It worked in Boston, you know, it worked in New York, it worked in Miami, it worked in the UK. And so we had, um, I think we had scaled uh, in what, it, what is called like a flag planting strategy, mm -hmm. uh, which was to open a lot of studios in different places, which showed prospective investors like, wow, this really works and look at how much low hanging fruit exists within the cities they are already in. Mm -hmm. um, I think another differentiator was that we were the first having been born in 1998 before any other boutique fitness of size existed. There's always something there. You know, there's always something to be said about um, standing the test of time. And by the time we did a private equity investment, 
we had been around for 17 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I would also say, lastly, the culture at Barry's is really special. Um, and North Castle and, and a lot of the other, you know, groups that were, uh, competing recognize that culture. Speaking of culture, Sarah Emerson is asking, has the private equity funding changed the Barry's culture? Any key changes to the operations that, that threaten the Barry's values? Yeah, so I have a very odd private equity relationship and story. Um, they have been the most incredible partners. Uh, and from the very beginning, part, when, when they interviewed me you know, to think about who they wanted to be in the CEO role, one of the things I said which in hindsight was probably very stupid, was, you know, for me, the most important thing is my people, my culture, and like the bottom line always comes second. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, many years later, John Kanarik, who's my direct contact there, said that's actually why they chose me, because oh. um, that's a, a genuine thing that I feel, um, but they're smart enough to know that like serves the bottom line, you know, when <laughs> people are happy and customers can see it. Uh, that's a really important quality for a leader to have, especially, I think, in culture-driven business like boutique fitness. Do you feel that that has to do with sort of uh, you hiring maybe your early, your friends in the early days? I, I read that somewhere about what you did. Um, I think it more has to do with what it feels like, the level of empathy you have um, mm -hmm. as a leader who also cleaned toilets, who taught back-to-back, -back, you know, classes, who woke up at like 5 a.m. and didn't get home till 11 p.m. You know, I've been working for Barry's since long before labor laws <laughs> existed <laughs> to the extent that they do now. Yeah. Um, and so I've just seen it all. You know, I've mm -hmm. seen and touched every part of the business. <clears throat> That's awesome. Uh, next question from Marianita. She's asking, how are your trainers engaging and connecting with clients virtually uh, before COVID and now, you know, what was done in the Red Room and any specific uh, strategies maybe that can be replicated in other uh, businesses? So uh, before COVID, I mean, a majority of people are on social media, you know, most notably Instagram. Uh, and I know trainers regularly share their handles with customers. And I can tell you just from being an instructor at Barry's, every time someone takes a class, um, I'll log on and there are at least, you know, half a dozen posts about the class that they just took with me. Um, and so there's constant engagement on social media. Um, I think the, the, what we tried to do with Berries at Home was limit how we change, kind of limit the difference that people felt with in terms of how they were engaging with their instructors. What I mean by that, not just instructors, also like we have moderators on these mm -hmm. calls for Berries at Home because our Berries at Home platform now, it won't in the future, but takes place on Zoom. Um, and what you have when you enter the room, your first experience is a moderator welcoming you, right? Which is very similar to what happens when you enter a red room. You're met by a smile, hopefully at the front desk, uh, a light board that says something fun uh, and people explaining to you, you know, what will happen in the class if you're a first timer? Uh, the first timer goes in to meet the instructor. These are all things that we're actually still doing on Berries at Home. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the touch points, while they're virtual, they still feel very much the same. Um, and a lot of times, you've probably all seen this, but you'll do like, you'll flex with your instructor outside, you know, the class when it's over and be like, just finish class with so and so. Mm -hmm. And we'll actually do that now on Zoom too. We'll all like kind of do that, and people will turn their cameras around. And so we really just tried to maintain a lot of the same traditions that we have historically. Yeah, no, that's great advice. Actually, even on Zoom, you know, mentioning each person's name, we used to do that for a little while. And then the members, you know, too many participants joining to, to call out everybody's name, but that's great uh, advice. Um, in terms of the interaction with... Uh, By the way, that you just made a really good point. Sorry to cut you off, but yeah. we, we also are, because it's a video sharing experience, we as the trainers are calling people out, whether it's you're doing a great job or, you know, something around like, Joseph, you need to, you know, soften mm -hmm. your knees right now and don't use your lower back. And um, I think people really appreciate that because they feel like they're actually in studios having yeah. the attention of their instructor. 
Yeah, and definitely, are, is there specific uh, guardrails or guidelines that you give the instructors uh, when they interact on social media because they are representing the brand? Um, how does that work or is it just um, Yeah, open we, definitely, we definitely have um, contracts that stipulate like what it means to stay in line with the Barry's values. Mm -hmm. um, it's not easy to police, but it's just showing, you know, a certain degree of professionalism, never making comments that would be disparaging or that would upset groups of people, um, anything that you would expect, right? Because people are at their Instagram showing that they're employees of Barry's typically, and you just want to make sure that they're a good representation of your brand. Awesome. Uh, we have a question came in from Amelia Lowe. She sent it by private message. Any advice to people who want to uh, <coughs> become entrepreneurs at this time? <laughs> uh, specific to like studios? Like uh, brick Amelia, and feel free to, or? yeah, Amelia, feel free to, if you want to jump in uh, or any, are you there? Okay. Yeah, no, Joey, any advice that you have maybe on somebody that wants to uh, become an entrepreneur, some advice from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, from my, my perspective is limited because I only know, you know, my own life. But I, I would recommend if, you're, if your goal is to be a, an entrepreneur, but you don't know yet what it is you're doing, um, start with what you love, you know, follow your passion. Think of something that like will get you excited about it every day you wake up because the whole definition of being an entrepreneur, even though people think it's about innovation, it's actually just finding solutions to problems. <laughs> That's what it becomes. Mm -hmm. So you have to really, I mean, there's so much fun in it, but there is for the first few years, constantly just trying to navigate and figure out how you're going to get things done. And if at the root of it, you are not absolutely in love with what it is you're doing, it's, it's going to be a lot more challenging. For sure. Uh, we'll jump back into the questions uh, pre-submitted. A question from Nate uh, Gray. He's saying that, you know, it looks like you're, you came a long way to, to find your, uh, your success. What advice would you give to other innovators who are still striving for that success? Um, what advice would I give to entrepreneurs who are like struggling or striving for success? Striving, is that what yeah. The question yeah. Is? Mm -hmm. Striving. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's similar to what I just said earlier. Just make sure that whatever it is you're doing uh, is is a, a project of passion and something that, you know, you feel connected to. Um, I think I can share practices that I have in my life that help me get through hard times, mm -hmm. um, one of which is meditation. Uh, it's a big part of my life, and I do it every morning, uh, and it really helps still your mind, uh, focus on the things that are actually happening, right? Versus what's happening in our thought world. Um, and then I also have an executive coach that I work with. Um, and that's been extremely valuable for me to stay really focused. Definitely. Uh, some more questions. I mean, you know, we're most entrepreneurs, um, most of the participants on this call are entrepreneurs and they're always trying to raise money. So <laughs> forgive the questions that are repetitive about raising money. Uh, question from Liliana. She's asking, uh, was there a key factor that helped you get uh, the necessary funding? Like how well defined was your, was your plan? Uh, yeah, I think, um, I think for Barry's, it's kind of, a, it was an unfair situation because the only time we went to raise money, it was just, already a globally recognized brand mm -hmm. um and like i mentioned it was like a very competitive process so we didn't have to do much um we grew for 17 years organically just with our own investment um and so you know that's one approach it just takes a long time um i'm not the best person to ask how do you raise money for you know a business in its infancy of course, there are like angel investors, like you can find people that feel passionately about the brand um, or about your business who can invest. Um, I think in those cases, it's always best to find people um, who A, you're aligned with from a values standpoint to make sure it doesn't become an issue uh, and B, who can actually help you create value. 
Mm -hmm. um, that would be my advice. Great. Uh, next question from Preeti Gupta. Uh, is there anything different you'll be doing given the crisis in terms of uh, cost stru cost structuring a plan B or are you thinking more online products or are you planning towards uh, kind of, you know, the opening that we're going back into? Uh, so our in-studio experience, which has already started to happen first in Texas, next will be Atlanta, followed by Nashville, and we just found out California next week, I believe, um, will be uh, limited in terms of capacity. And so where we used to have 40 to 50 people in a room, now we're going to have 20 or less. Uh, and so what that's meant for us is you know, shutting off of certain amenities. We have a, a, a fuel bar concept, which is like food and beverage, which will not be turning on for the next few months until, you know, we're able to generate a little bit more revenue. Uh, um, there've also been uh, laws that are, are forbidding, forbidding gyms to open with showers. Mm -hmm. uh, so in some of these studios as well, we won't have locker room or shower experiences. Um, within our red room, which is what we call our the exercise room, we'll have individuals who are spaced at least six feet apart on both treadmills and on the floor. Uh, and we'll be conducting deep cleaning um, halfway through class so that when people switch, um, they're not touching any dirty equipment or any you know treadmill that has been sweat on or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, our labor model has had to change. Um, so we're only going to have one person at the desk, which we believe will be okay. We've already seen it works in Texas based on um, our, we have a feature on our app called geo check-in. Mm -hmm. And what that means is once you're within a hundred yards of a Barry's studio, you can actually just go into your app and check in yourself. Um, so we're actually limiting the uh, experience between the front desk and the person, the customer. Um, we also have touchless uh, temperature um, readers, which are, they're basically like screens, iPads that you walk up to and you put your, your face in sort of the outline and it scans your face and either turns red or green to show you know, that your temperature is below 100 degrees. Um, we've done a lot. I mean, I could probably go on and on for 20 minutes around how operationally we've pivoted. Um, and then in regards to berries at home, we are continuing to sort of invest time and resource into uh, premiumizing the experience. So, you know, hopefully coming off Zoom soon, uh, using another product that can be fully integrated uh, into the berries experience. Um, we're building a whole new app um, that will pull all of these things in together as well as uh, launch our loyalty program, which is coming within the next couple months. So we do have a lot of innovation and change both at the studio and digital levels. Mm -hmm. Speaking of innovation, what is sort of that process within the company? Do you have a innovation unit or how do you get new ideas for uh, new technology? Or do you have a CTO? How, how does that work? Uh, we have a head of technology. Um, <clears throat> that seems like a separate question, right? To the, mm -hmm. how the innovation happens. Yeah. Um, and our executive team, we meet often and through this crisis, we've meet, met twice as often as we usually do. Um, and everybody is really a stakeholder at the table. And so we discuss, um, like I was saying earlier, a lot of the like opportunities that might exist and what solutions we might have to some of the problems that we're facing. Um, and it's very, very collaborative. Once we land on, you know, innovation is one of our core values. So I feel like everybody who works at Berries is always thinking of ways to change and grow. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once we're able to, you know, land on what it is we want to do from a vision standpoint, that's when we start to, to build out the strategy uh, and execute on it. And do you localize that innovation in different cities or do you let's start, uh, you know, pilot it in Los Angeles? <laughs> roll it out? Uh, how does that work? Uh, digitally, no. But from a marketing standpoint, definitely. We have global campaigns uh, and then we have micro campaigns. Um, and what that means is we will give, you know, studio managers and their teams the autonomy to come up with, um, you know, next week I want to do a Barry's Dallas bingo card where 
we have all the instructors on a card and you have to get, you know, four of them across. And uh, it's like all of those ideas are really important for us to, to give our studio leadership the opportunity to think through. So that's one way that we spread it across the organization. Great. Uh, uh, really a jam packed question from Liliana. She's asking about your executive coach. What did you look for? Um, she tried one session, maybe, um, what, what did, uh, sort of the feedback, uh, did you look for and, and all that's any advice on, on selecting a coach? Yeah. So there are a lot of different types of coaches out there. Mm -hmm. Um, mine, uh, I would say for the first four weeks, all we talked about was my childhood, which I was, I thought was really interesting because I thought I was hiring somebody to help me like organize thought, you know, <laughs> and become a more effective leader. Uh, and it was definitely, you know, that that's a part of that process, right? He wanted to pop the hood and figure out like, who am I dealing with? Um, and so my executive coach is like somebody who, um, his name's Martin Hubbard. And he's somebody who really focused on the psychology of leadership. Um, somebody who's been pivotal in helping my leadership team grow together. Uh, somebody who has um, really helped develop our mission, vision, and values and scale them across the organization. He's also helped, um, you know, resolve conflict between different members of the team. Um, so that's been my personal experience with executive coach. The second part of her question, she's asking if the coach offers feedback and direction, uh, like what's, you know, how, in, how involved are they with what you do sort of maybe day to day or the planning in general? Uh, not involved at all with my day to day. It's very high level. Um, we talk about, you know, the things that are important to me or that are weighing my, on my mind. Um, I would agree that I, don't think he often lays out um, solutions. Uh, I think he more helps me think about what to prioritize. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, that's been my experience. But he's also working um, with all the members of the executive team and a couple layers below that as well. Great. Uh, next question from Eve Lisa. She's asking before COVID, uh, what was a difficult business decision you had to make as CEO that resulted in a surprisingly effective, positive result more than expected before mm. COVID? Uh, Eve Lisa, if you want to unpack that question or, or add more context. Um. Hey, sorry. I think it might be very loud, so it might be hard for you to oh, okay. hear, but I just, yeah, if there was ever a time when maybe um, maybe there was a partnership you were exploring, you weren't sure, just, just, you know, decisions, big decisions that maybe a CEO is confronted with, and then by sort of trusting your gut or looking at all the evidence, it ended up being really positive and maybe surprised you. Um, yeah, so... I, I don't have a specific example to give you, but I would just tell you that um, my life, both inside and out of work, uh, has the pattern for me has always been when I'm experiencing um, the most difficulty uh, as a result of my actions, um, I, I, I somehow end up experiencing um, a tremendous amount of learning, change, changing, and complete joy. Like the outcome has always been for me that the hardest moments in my life um, are often followed by the best, which means next year is going to be a really good year. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did see that in, in 2019, you guys had the Saturday Night Live uh, skit in, in yeah. December. So maybe that wasn't such good luck for, <laughs> for this. Yeah. Hopefully next year will be better. Yeah. Uh, there was a question about the... Yeah, we skipped uh, Mehmet's question about how do you see the exit scenario from PE? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we actually were in the process of running a transaction um, in March. 
and we were probably weeks away from doing that from North Castle exiting uh, and then COVID hit. And so now um, as a result, I would say it's probably going to be another three years before the business could rebound. Um, it was bittersweet for me, A, because you know, it was obviously going to be an opportunity for me from a monetiz monetization standpoint, but I love North Castle so much um, that I was, you know, nervous about who my new partner would be and to have a few extra years for them, you know, is, is, is a welcomed outcome. Uh, great. Next question from Sarah Emerson. She's asking uh, what considerations you made regarding the decision to grow through a franchise versus direct ownership. I think they're partners, yeah. correct? You are, or are they franchisees? So um, we have a, we have quite a mix. We have JVs, franchises, mm -hmm. and then the majority of the U.S. The U.S. is corporately owned and operated. Um, back in 2011, we started to sell franchises, the first of which was the studio, the aforementioned studio in Bergen, Norway. Um, and then we started to sell franchises domestically. And that was something that, that my the previous partners and I were not really aligned on. I really wanted to grow, um, you know, just through Barry's corporate, um, but also understood that it was a very easy, low risk from a financial standpoint, way to get more studios open quickly. Uh, and so there were some markets that we sold, San Francisco, Boston, Nashville, Miami. Um, and in hindsight, even though I wasn't the most supportive, it was an incredible way for us, not only to grow, but to have really amazing leaders on the ground who were um, building and fostering, you know, a culture that I wouldn't have been able to remotely. Um, and since then, uh, all of them, Barry's Miami is actually the only remaining franchise here in the US. Uh, and then internationally, most of them are franchises with the exception of the U. K and Canada, which are JVs, um, and our Australian and Singapore studios are actually a, a part of a, a fairly large franchise for Southeast Asia, or for Pacific, uh, mm -hmm. for back. yeah. Uh, great, so we have a question. Uh, Alex wants to ask a question. Alex, are you there? Let me unmute the mic. Okay, Alex, whenever you're ready, uh, feel free to, to jump in. Um, we have a question from Constantine. He's asking what was the biggest obstacle you had to overcome? I would say this right now. Yeah. COVID has been, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Definitely. Um, Next question from Julie Lee. She's asking, what is one lesson you wish you had known before you started? Uh, I think my mantra now is replace fear with focus. And I wish someone had told me that at the very beginning mm. because it's very, very helpful. <laughs> replace fear with focus. Yep. Awesome. Uh, next question from Marissa. What goes into strategic planning for the different in-studio challenges that Barry does? How long in advance do you plan these? I guess she, she might be a customer. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, a few different kinds of challenges. We have um, frequency challenges, which is probably what she's referring to. Uh, and we plan these, I'd say we start to plan them at least three months out. Um, there, there's a lot of tech development that goes with them from the front and the back end. Um, and you know there are a lot of partnership opportunities that require dialogue and discussion. Um, and there are a lot of uh, internal conversations we have around you know, what, who the beneficiary should be because we usually we tie a nonprofit organization to it that benefits from it. Um, so the process is such that it takes place um, with my, not only my PR and brand marketing team, but also my traditional marketing team. And we all sit together and, and think through, you know, what we want it to be like and how we want it to feel and what we want it to say. Uh, and then wheels, you know, are in motion from there for approximately the next three months. 
Great. Um, in the last uh, three minutes here that we have you, uh, if you can just answer this question by Marianita, she's asking, um, when you started being an amazing uh, trainer, uh, did you visualize yourself being a CEO and uh, you still host uh, classes, but how did that opportunity happen? Did you just show up every day and stick with it? Or Yeah, it was, I did not visualize myself being the CEO. I am not someone who showed up with that ambition. Um, I think sometimes I'm still surprised that I am. Um, but, and you know, the other question she asks is, do you miss giving classes? Um, I still give classes. In fact, I'm teaching one in, in an hour. Um, so I teach Monday and Fridays online. And then I usually teach Saturday in the studio. Um, and I, I think I answered it all. Was there another one? Yeah. 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 Great. Um, so now as you know, the world is opening back up and um, entrepreneurs on, on this call, any like last minute advice you can give to uh, us as we go back into this new reality and uh, any specific call to action that you would like from, from our community? Um, you know, nothing specific comes to mind. I, I think um, the last few months have just been so hard for everyone you know, and in a lot of ways, um, adversity fuels greatness. Um, so I think that people should just like dig in and be introspective and think about what has come bubbling up to the surface and let them, you know, be fueled by that once they get to go outside and, and make change in the world. 